Hi, I'm Andrew Ward, pastor at Community Baptist Church, and we're excited to have you join us for this service. Hey, if you're in the Flagler County area and you don't have a church home, we want to invite you to come join us. On Sunday mornings, we meet at 1030 for our worship service, and then we have a midweek fill-up service on Wednesdays at 645. I pray that today's message is a blessing. God bless. I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles this morning, Romans chapter 1, we begin or continue our study through the book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter 1 here this morning. You ever wonder why do people do what they do? What is the reason? I mean, why would uh, someone who's been known as a, a trustworthy person ruin their career by stealing from their employer? Uh, why would a person who struggles with addiction keep going back over and over again why would a, a person with a wonderful family make the choice to, to commit adultery? Why, why do people do what they do? This past week, I read an article about a brother and sister. Uh, they were 81 and 74 years old. Uh, what caught my attention about the article was uh, the picture of the woman uh, and the uh, dis distraught look on her face as she was um, having her mugshot taken. She and her brother were arrested for insurance fraud. And as I, as I read the details of what they do, did, I thought to myself, no rational person would do this and think that they're not going to get caught. It was obvious that they were going to, to get caught. Why in the world would, would someone do something like this? It's providential that I'm thinking about this and even looking at that article in the very week that I'm studying for this message that we're looking at here today because God's Word answers this question, why do we do what we do? With that, we'll turn our attention to the reading of God's Word. We're going to be in Romans chapter 1. We'll read two verses, beginning with verse 24. Therefore... God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come once again humbly before your throne. Your children coming to the table of our Father asking, as we do each week, please feed us. God, we pray that you would help us to understand what it is that your word teaches us, that we would see clearly what it means and how it applies to our life. And then, Lord, even more, that you would give us the strength and the courage to follow you to obey your word. Certainly your word teaches us that you do not mean for us to simply be hearers only, but we are to be doers, that our faith in you should transform our hearts. And this morning, as we look into your word and gain a better and more biblical understanding of why we do what we do, may we to an even greater degree submit ourselves to you that your Holy Spirit would transform us and continue the good work that you began in us, conforming us to the image of Christ. Lord, I ask that if there is someone in this room that has never repented of their sin and put their faith in Christ, once again, I pray, Lord, that you would open their eyes, that today would be the day, that they would know the hope that we have in Christ. It's for his glory and in his name that we pray. Amen. So the title of my message this morning, The Grave Danger of Following Your Heart. The Grave Danger of Following Your Heart. Just to recap here what Paul's been talking about leading up to this point, his line of thinking we saw in the first 15 verses that Paul um, introduces uh, the letter that he's about to write, and, and he concludes those 15 verses by telling the church in Rome that he's eager to, to preach the gospel to the people, the church that is there in Rome. He's eager to preach that gospel to them because, as he shares with us in verse 16, it is the power of God unto salvation, that there is no way that a person can be made right with God except 
through repentance and putting their faith in Jesus Christ alone, who died for the sins of man who was buried and rose again three days later. It is by belief in Christ alone that a person is saved. And it's for this reason that Paul says, I'm eager, I desire, I long to come to Rome and to to preach the gospel, to share with you the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in this gospel, Paul tells us there in verse 17, that God's righteousness is given to anyone who has put their faith in Christ. Listen, that's very important. The Bible teaches us very clearly that the problem that all people are born into this world with is a problem of unrighteousness. I recognize as we go through life, certainly we have needs and concerns and things that we desire. But above all of those things, God says the greatest need that we have is righteousness because He is righteous because God knows us, because God knows everything about us, and because He is righteous and holy, and we're not. We're separated from Him because of our sin. And so this gift of righteousness that God offers to us in Christ Jesus is the greatest need that we have. And Paul joyfully proclaims there in verse 17 that this is exactly what God has given to us in Christ Jesus. Listen to me. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin irrespective of what may be behind you, what sin or shortcoming, what place where you might have struggled, what trouble that you've had in your life, understand that according to and on the authority of the Word of God, if you repent of your sin and put your faith in Christ, that God sees you through the righteousness of Christ. It's the reason, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so in Christ, the very thing that we need is not only given to us, but it is is lavishly and abundantly supplied to us, that when the day comes for a person who has repented and put their faith in Christ to step across into eternity, when it's their turn to die, that if they've trusted Christ as their Savior, they will be welcomed into heaven. Because of the righteousness of Christ, not because of anything that we do. You can see the reason that Paul is so eager to go to Rome and to share this good news. There certainly is no greater news than that. He continues on here, laying out uh, the rest of the of the letter, and we we get into this section where we are this morning, Romans chapter one, verses eighteen through. Chapter 3, verse 20, I shared with you that in this passage of Scripture, almost three chapters there, Paul lays out an indictment against all of humanity. You may hear that and you say, now hold on, I I like this gospel talk. I like like to talk about this gift that God has given to us in Christ. Can't we focus here? Well, Paul wants to to make sure that, that all people understand that they are in desperate need of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that all people are in need of the righteousness that only comes through Jesus Christ because all people have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what Paul will say in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Very important that we understand, and we're in this section, and I've shared with you, it's as if Paul is a prosecuting attorney, and he's laying out his argument before the jury to show that every single person who has ever been born into this world, whether they are the most moral, upstanding citizen, or they are the worst criminal on the planet, every person is born into this world separated from God because of our sin. And he's just systematically in, in chapter 1, verse 18 to, through chapter 3, verse 20, systematically walking through and showing us our sin. You say, why in the world do you have to say this? My word, I think I would have rather gone fishing this morning rather than hear this bad news. Listen, The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is irrelevant if we are not first convinced of the desperate need of our condition. That if we step across into eternity, that God is not going to to ask whether we've been a nice person or a good neighbor, whether we've never really hurt people, whether people just generally liked us. He's going to ask about righteousness. He's a holy God. And this is the glorious truth of the gospel. 
Because of what Jesus Christ has done, you can have your sin forgiven. And so Paul is, is laying that out in, in, in these almost three chapters here before he goes on to talk more about, about this gospel that we have in Jesus Christ. He begins here in this section specifically, the, the remainder of chapter 1, verse 18 through verse 32, stating uh, something that we all universally know. In a couple of weeks, we talked about this. Uh, we know that there is a God. That's what Paul told us. We know that there is a God. Why? Because God has created us with that knowledge. Essentially, I told you that, that there is no such thing as an atheist. I understand that there are people that claim that they do not believe that there is a God, but with all due respect, I don't believe that because God has written a knowledge of himself on our hearts so that we are without excuse. We know that there is a God, every person born into this world. So Paul says there's no such thing as an atheist. However, we talked about last week, even though we know there's a God, we refuse to worship him. We, we know that he is the creator, that he is worthy of worship and honor and praise and, and certainly thanksgiving, and yet we refuse to acknowledge him as God. We refuse to worship him. And last week, I, I talked with you about the fact that, that this is simply unreasonable. It is unreasonable. It is unconscionable that the God who has created all things, the God who has seen fit to create each one of us, the God who has sustained us all of our days, that we would not acknowledge his existence, that we would not bow ourselves before him in worship and in thanksgiving and in humble adoration. It is simply unreasonable. Romans chapter 11, verse 36, Paul writes this, for from him, this is God, For from him and through him and to him are all things. That's everything. Everything that we have and everything that we are is from God. And so he caps that off and says, to God be the glory forever. Amen. Listen, I would contend that when a person recognizes the truth of that statement, that all that they have and all that they are, their health, their mental faculties, their ability to, to, to work and earn a living, their, their family, their everything that they have, when they recognize that this is from God, truly in the depths of our heart, when we know that this is from God, How can we do anything other than praise him, worship him? It's the reason the psalmist says in chapter 29, verses 1 and 2, Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe, this is declare, proclaim to the Lord. Ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. I think our tendency, especially in this culture in which we live, is to get so caught up in our own lives, the things that we have, the hopes and dreams that we uh, that we have, the things that we want to accomplish and fulfill. We get so caught up in this that we lose sight of what's important. And, and the gospel, the word of God, draws us back. It reframes our thinking and says, look, that, that your life does not simply consist of the, the, the little bit of time that you have here on this earth. There's so much more. God has created us for eternity, and and the significance, the meaning, the purpose in life, it goes so far beyond what's going on in my life. God says, lift up your eyes and see him, and you will see the meaning and the purpose of of life. So we should should worship God, however as unthinkable as, as refusing to worship God is. We all do it, don't we? We all do this very thing. It's the reason that Paul says in chapter 1, verse 18, why the wrath of God is revealed because of our refusal to bow before him. But God's wrath, sadly, as we read through Scripture and we look at the world in which we live, is not much of a deterrent to, to people. It's not much of a deterrent to sin. The wrath of God, even though the Bible teaches it very clearly. And I think we have to wonder, why is that? Why is that? It has to do with the heart, the heart of the individual. And that's what we're going to be talking about here this morning. It's the heart of the individual. This is why we do what we do. 
Now, before we get started, I think that a biblical definition of the heart is in order. When we typically, in this culture, think about the heart, it's usually defined in terms of the seat of emotion. We talk about things like love and and affection that we feel for someone else. Certainly, in a biblical definition, that's included. But the Bible goes beyond that. When the Bible talks about the heart, it's really talking about the the seat of who you are as a person. Your thoughts, your emotions, your responses, your will, all of those things are, are encased in the biblical definition of the heart. That's what the Bible's talking about here. And, and it commands that we would give particular attention to the heart. It's the reason that the writer of Proverbs says in chapter 4, verse 23, Watch over. That that word there means guard. It gives the idea of setting up a military guard to, to guard a post. Watch over your heart with all diligence. That means don't dilly-dally. Don't pussyfoot around. Don't get distracted. Don't play games. Watch over your heart with all diligence. Why? The Bible says because from it flow the springs of life. This is everything about us, why we do what we do, the responses that we have to circumstances in life. So often we get focused on thinking it's about the circumstances, and the Bible says it's about the heart. It's about what we believe. That that when we come into situations and and trouble, especially tragedy and difficulty in life, that it really is, is almost like a gauge on the dashboard of our life that's showing us what we really believe. Because the person who trusts in God, the person who's walking intimately with God will have the peace of God that passes all understanding. It will guard their heart and their mind in Christ Jesus. A people, that, person that becomes afraid and terrified or angry or whatever it might be. It's, it's telling them, those emotions are telling that person that there's a problem between our relationship with God. There's a disconnect there between our relationship with God and ourselves. Now that's certainly good news because God stands with open hands to welcome us to him, to walk with him, to talk with him, to know him, to be known by him. This is what scripture calls us to. And Paul in this passage of scripture is going to address people who although they know that there's a God, are unwilling to worship him as God. Uh, but rather would chase after their own man-made gods. Paul says here in verse 24, in light of that, therefore God gave them over. Now, that statement, God gave them over, it's made three times in this passage. Uh, As you look to the end of the chapter, you'll see it in verse 24, verse 26, and and verse 28. Uh, That statement, God gave them over, is actually, actually an expression of the wrath of God. That's what Paul's referencing here. Last week I mentioned that there are various ways that God's wrath is demonstrated in the Bible. Uh, you, You think about the wrath of God, you could think about that from the perspective of judgment that's already taken place. For example, the flood that came upon the earth in Genesis uh, tells us about uh, the wrath of God, the judgment of God. Israel's captivity, after years and years of disobeying and rebelling against God, God told them that they were going to go into captivity. Ultimately, they were taken into captivity as punishment for their sin. Again, you see in this the judgment of God or the wrath of God being released. And so that's one respect that we could consider the wrath of God. Another way would be in thinking about the judgment that is still to come. You can read about that in the the various prophets throughout Scripture and prophecies that are given in Scripture. Probably most notably, the one that people are familiar with would be the book of Revelation. You see there the coming judgment that God promises. This is the coming wrath of God. So those are two ways that the wrath of God is expressed. But last week I I shared with you, and we're going to dig into it more today, What might at first glance seem a more subtle way that the wrath of God is is visited upon an individual or a nation or even the entire world? Uh, While subtle, however, we, we should not let down our guard and think that it doesn't really matter because I would contend that, that it is a terrible judgment that comes on people when, when God, listen, when God begins to remove his restraining influence on an individual's life. 
When God begins to remove a restraining influence on on a a, a nation or on the world, when, when essentially what happens is God responds to the rebellion of people by saying, okay, you can have your sin. Go do what you want. Live the way that you want. And, and, and what happens is, is that the, the, the person's sin or the nation or the entire world, that, that sin mounts on top of sin on top of sin. It's in this place that, that God, as he says here uh, in these verses, gives people over. And that's a terrible fate. This idea of God giving people over. Uh, that same phrase that, that, that Paul uses there in verse 24, therefore God gave them over. Same phrase that Paul, all, I'm sorry, that God also uses in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He's speaking of Jesus. He says there in Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for all of us. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? So he delivered him over. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying, and I'm trying to help you to understand the terrible nature of God giving over an individual. That's what the Bible says there, that he did with Jesus as Jesus was nailed to the cross to take on the sin of the world. The Bible says he was delivered over. He was given over. And so horrific was the experience that our Lord had that in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, he cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Listen, keep in mind who we're talking about here. This is not just a man born into the world. This is God himself, the very son of God that set aside the glory of heaven and came into this world, took on human flesh, lived a perfect life, the God who has always been. Jesus hung on that cross, and so terrible was the wrath of God upon him that he cries out, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was given over by the Father to the full measure of the wrath of God to pay for sin. Uh, This is to say that the penalty for sin uh, fell upon Jesus. And when it did, God the Father removed the restraint of his wrath as it fell upon our Lord. Jesus took the punishment there on the cross and experienced the very wrath of God. He was given over to it. The idea being given over by the by God will make the wise person fear. If you understand what Scripture teaches about this, the wise person will be afraid at the idea of being given over to the wrath of God. This passage indicates that there's a that there's a progressive nature as we continue on studying through the end of the, the, the first chapter. We'll see that there's a progressive nature to the wrath of God. This is a, a step, if you will, along the way. Verses 19 through 23, it tells us that God made himself known to the people, but we reject him, so the judgment increases. God trying to get our attention to cause us to come before him, to to, to bow before him in worship and adoration, recognizing him for who he is. The, 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 The judgments will come as we continue on through this. However, it's important for us to also recognize that this isn't necessarily in some rapid fire succession. I'm trying to help you to understand God's purpose here is to draw people to himself and and people who rebel will suffer the the wrath or the judgment of God. And and God's purpose in all of this, we see in in chapter 2, verse 4. Turn over there, maybe just a page. Uh, Paul says here in chapter 2, verse 4, in thinking about this idea of judgment, He says, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. God's purpose in all things is that we would repent, that we would turn to him. He does not desire that we would perish, but has extended this opportunity in Christ that we can be saved. And he reaches out to us in one of the ways is, is by allowing us to have our sin, to experience uh, the measure of our own sin and the, the, the consequences and the trouble that comes with it in hopes that we would turn to God. And God desires that we would repent and turn to Him. But there comes a, a point where 
where it just continues to get worse and worse and worse. Why? Again, because God wants people to repent, but also because God is holy. It's very important that we understand, that we keep in mind what we talked about a few weeks ago. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And people tend to thumb their nose and they say, that's not true. I don't believe that. I don't like that. But there's no way that you can read scripture and and come to any other conclusion. God is very, very clear. Again, it's in the bad news that the significance of what it is Christ did for us in sacrificing himself that we could be forgiven, it, it becomes glorious news when you know that God will not condemn you if you'll repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ. But when we rebel, when we refuse, Paul says right there in verse 24, God gave them over. Now look what he says. In the lusts, of their heart to impurity. That's a very significant statement there. Take note of that. To understand why being given over to the lust of your heart is such a terrible fate, we need to understand what the Bible teaches about the human heart. I've defined it for you, but let's look at what the Bible says uh, the condition of the human heart is. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 is very illuminating, tragically so. As Jeremiah writes, the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Our tendency is to think very highly of ourselves, to think that we're not that bad. And yet the Bible says that our heart, the very seat of who we are, is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? doesn't mean that we do the worst thing that we could possibly do. It doesn't mean that we are as bad as we could possibly be. By God's grace, his restraining influence keeps that from us. But it is a picture of what's going on in our heart. Another illustration you see in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, before the flood. It says there, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was very great on the earth, and that every look... Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I think as we look around this culture that we're living in today, we can see evidence of that, horrifically so, that, that, that the intent of the thoughts of the heart of people is evil continually. Now, what is the measurement of that? It is the standard of God, the holiness of God. It is not the, the, the ideas of man, what we would consider to be right and wrong, what we would consider to be acceptable behavior or unacceptable behavior. God says the standard by which he measures is himself, is his holiness. And he says, by that standard, we are all guilty. One more, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26. He who trusts, listen, he who trusts in his own heart. Now, this is a very powerful language he uses here. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. That's what the Bible says. He who believes that he's going to make this up for himself, how you think that you should live your life, that you can come to your own conclusions, that you can live however you choose according to your standard of measurement, that you'll be okay, God says that person's a fool. And they will find out that there is a God who is holy and that he does keep his word. Our hearts will always, listen, our hearts will always lead us astray because our hearts desire self-satisfaction no matter the cost. And that leaves us in a hopeless position. There's nothing that we can do. And this is the reason that, again, the, the gospel is so wonderful. Because it's only through the new birth, it's only through repenting and putting your faith in Jesus Christ is there hope. But in Christ, the hope is immeasurable. You are accepted into the family of God. You are forgiven. You have a hope and a future. The God who created you loves you, cares for you. You can know peace and joy. That's, that's the only hope that there is in any of this. Now that statement that Paul makes there, uh, to impurity. Again, looking there in, in, in verse 24, therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their heart, to impurity. That is a a reference to to sexual sin. God in his grace restrains human hearts to keep people from being as bad as they could be. However, one of the ways, as we've talked about, 
that God expresses his wrath is to give people over to the desires of their heart to rebel against God. And so often that takes the form of sexual sin. Not always, but so often it takes the form of of sexual sin. Now, I think it's important before we go any further talking about this because it will be relevant next week as we continue on through this passage, uh, just to to, to reiterate the biblical teaching as it relates to to sex, because oftentimes in the culture, this is a place where where people will, will mock the word of God and say, God's just against sex. What difference does it make? Let people do whatever it is that they want to do. What difference does it make if two consenting adults do whatever they, they want to do? Why does this matter? Well, there's good reason you see here in Scripture why it matters. Uh, It it really uh, first begins with the understanding that God is the creator of this. Uh, Don't misunderstand that that this wasn't an accident or a byproduct of of creation that caught God unaware. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall, look, become one flesh. This is God's idea. He cooked the whole thing up on his own. Just the way that it is. He likes it. And, 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 and it, within the context of, of marriage, is a glorious and beautiful thing. And people shouldn't talk about it like it's dirty, because it's not. That's not what the Bible teaches. But, but when, when this gift is used outside the context of what God designed it for, when, when it gets abused, that's where the problem comes in. And maybe you say, well, I still don't understand. What difference does it make for two consenting adults Well, it makes a difference because of the dignity and the worth of a human being. This is what it all comes down to. When you look at Genesis chapter 1, you look at Genesis chapter 2, and you see that that, that God creates all things. In fact, as you go through that narrative, the first 25 verses in Genesis chapter 1, where God is is willing all things into existence, uh, just kind of on a rapid fire, God's creating everything that is. And it's like, my word, please slow down. I'd like to know, know a little bit more about how you made all of these things. But he's doing it for a reason. He's teaching us that he created all that is. That's what's important. He moves on to what is more important to him. Because the whole narrative slows down in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Because he focuses in on human beings creating people. And he says he created people in his own image. We're talking about what's the problem with, with, with people having sex outside of marriage and defying God's laws as it relates to, to, to sex between a man and a woman. And it has to do with the dignity and the worth of a human being. You see, God sees you not as some animal, contrary to popular uh, uh, opinion. You are not some animal that evolved out of some primordial slime billions of years ago. You have been created by God himself in the image of God. And God says, for that very reason, you have dignity and worth and value. It's not about how much money you have or, or whether you, you look a certain way or how much education you have or what your abilities are. It's about the fact that you are created by God in his image. That's why you have value and dignity and worth. It's the reason that we don't murder children in the womb. And it's the reason that, that you don't euthanize people who are unhealthy. It's because of the dignity of human beings. That's why. We're created in the image of God, and it's not because of what I can do that makes me of value and worth. It's because of who made me. Listen, if if you don't get anything out of this message today other than that, and that settles in your heart, that you have value and dignity and worth because of the fact that you are created in the image of God, if you let that settle in your heart, it'll set you free. It'll give you peace and joy that passes all understanding. You won't live your life trying to measure yourself by some arbitrary standard saying, I don't look good enough. I don't have enough money. I can't do this. I wish I was like this person. That person's better than me. When you understand that the thing that makes you of worth is that you are created in the image of God and you're no accident. God made you. He loves you so much that he gave his own son. When that gets into your heart, it'll fill you with joy, by the way. But God says this is really at, the, at the, the heart of the reason for his prohibition against sex. It's a beautiful and a glorious thing. And God says that you are worth so much that nobody gets to have that relationship with, that, with you 
if they're not willing to pledge their whole life to you. That's what God says. That, that's what it's all about. It's not some random, arbitrary rule that God makes there. It has to do with being created in the image of God. And so you can know that this will be an area where there will be great temptation, where, where, where Satan will attack people. Because it mars the image of God. It degrades human beings when they engage in sexual immorality. That's what the Bible says. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 to 20. He says here, flee immorality. Now, let me tell you about that word, flee. Imagine how you would respond if in the middle of the night you woke up and your whole house was on fire. How would you get out of the house? That's what Paul's saying there. Flee immorality. Uh, don't go in your closet looking for, for your best clothes to put on and, and, and rooting around for your valuables. If the whole house is on fire, you're going to get out too sweet. Flee from immorality. Now listen to what he says. We're in Second, or 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Every other sin a man commits is outside his body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. So God says that when a person engages in sexual immorality, that they are actually sinning against degrading their own body. Verse 19, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, uh, that you are, look, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Oh, listen, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that I hope will sink deeply into your heart. This is what God offers to us. There's this idea that's so often preached and sadly is preached in, in, in churches across this country and around the world. This easy believism where people think you just pray a prayer and get baptized and that's what, what saves you. Jesus invites you into a relationship with him if you are willing to repent of your sin. That means come into agreement with God about your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not acknowledging the existence of Jesus Christ. The demons, James tells us, the demons believe and they shudder. It's not acknowledging that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. He is who he says he is, whether you acknowledge it or not. When the Bible talks about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, it means turning to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, don't say you love me and then not do what I say. A follower of Jesus Christ has been transformed. They love God. That's something that an unbeliever cannot do. They desire to follow Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean perfectly, but there's a transformation that takes place. Paul says here, you are not your own. The deal that we have with God when we repent and put our faith in Christ is to exchange this life that's perishing for eternal life that cannot be taken away. That's what God offers. So you are not your own. It's as if we think about this idea of stewardship. It's as if you're a foreign missionary. That's exactly what you are. Paul says in Philippians that our citizenship's in heaven. And so we're foreign missionaries using the time, talent, and treasure that God has entrusted to us to bring him glory. That's what it's all about. All right, so you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. He says, therefore, glorify God with your body. Therefore, the Bible says in Romans 121, or 124, when, when he, he turns them over to the lusts of their heart, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Now, I understand the rest of the world would not consider sexual immorality to be dishonoring. People think it's wonderful. But we're talking about God's standard, and he says it dishonors an individual. Continuing on, verse 25. He says, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is forever blessed. Of course, Paul's making reference back up to verse 23, where he says an, an exchange. Well, let's go back up to 22 just to reset the, con- uh, the, the context. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God for an incorruptible uh, form. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, for the form of corruptible man 
and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That's what Paul's referencing there uh, when he says that they worshiped and served the, the creature rather than the creator. Worshiping and serving the things of this world rather than the God who made the things of this world. That's essentially what, what Paul is, is saying there. He's telling us here in these, these verses that the, that the heart gripped by sin, it, it deludes people into believing a lie. Uh, people know the truth of, about God because God's made him known to them. Yet following the lust of their heart, people reject the truth given to them by God, and they choose to believe lies. Why? Well, because accepting a lie allows people to live any way that we want to. And, and now we're, we're going to just come to the dirty little secret. Why do we do what we do? We do what we do because we do what we want to do. We make the choices that we make because we want to. It's just no more difficult than that. We respond with the emotions that we do to a situation because of what's in our heart. That's what the Bible is, is teaching here. And the reason that people are, are willing to reject God even to their own detriment, even to the fact that God has unequivocally stated that the wrath of God will be upon them, people continue on for one reason. They love their sin. It's just no more pretty than that. People just love to sin. They love to lie and cheat and steal. They love sexual immorality. They love to gossip. They love greed. They love anything other than God. This is the problem. We, we come into this world broken and desiring these things. And that's the reason that people are willing to accept lies because it allows them to live any way that they choose. Listen, to, to, all, with all due respect to the, to the, the, the folks that believe uh, in, in evolution, if you sit down with an objective mind and, and just read what this state, it, there's no, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It makes no sense whatsoever. The only reason that people are willing to believe that is because it allows them to, to have a life independent of God. Uh, we talked about a couple of weeks ago the fact that God's written a knowledge of himself on our heart. He's given us a conscience. We know right from wrong. Uh, when, when someone believes that there is no God, it helps them to quiet their conscience so they can live however they want. That's just the bottom line. It's just no more glamorous than that. We just love to sin. When you reject the truth of God for a lie, the fruit is that you will always worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Uh, that is, we think about that idea of worship. You desire things other than God. You make other things in your life the most important thing, the thing for which you're willing to sacrifice everything else. That could be drugs. It could be money. It could be power. It could be prestige. It could be career. It could be family. Any number of things. Our hearts, John Calvin used to say, are like idle factories. We take things and we make them the most important things in our life, the thing for which we're willing to sacrifice everything else. Why? Because we believe those things will give us peace and joy and happiness and contentment and fulfillment. That's what we believe. But the Bible tells us in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The only way that we're going to find true peace and contentment and fulfillment and happiness and meaning in this life is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. But people will believe a lie because they love to sin. That's just the bottom line. We make up gods to suit ourselves. Now, let me apply this for you here. We're going we're gonna to stop right here. We're going to highlight the connection that Paul's making in verses 16 through 32. I want you to see in these verses that God created people to worship and to glorify him. And it's essential that we settle this in our mind. Listen to me. What is the meaning and the purpose of life? It's to exalt Jesus Christ. If, if, if you think that, that the meaning and purpose of your life is anything, I'm talking about the first thing, is anything beyond that or more important than that would be a better way to put that. You're going to chase after it. God says he made us, and we are to be worshipers because he's worthy. he's worthy of our worship and honor and praise. And when we don't worship him, we'll chase after all these other things. That's what he's, he's, he's called us to, and it's important that we settle this in our minds, that this is what God has made us for. 
However, because of Adam's rebellion against God, we're born with sin, rebellion in our hearts, a desire to rebel against God. And in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, we learn that God has provided the only solution to our problem. It's God's amazing grace in the gospel. It's the only way. Repenting. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. And when a, listen, when a person is born again, they're supernaturally changed by God. The old heart that desires the things of this world is taken away. The heart of stone is taken away, and they're given a heart of flesh. They desire to honor and to glorify God, to know God, to exalt Him. That's what He gives to us, a desire to follow Christ and to live a different life. The human heart that hasn't been changed by Jesus Christ, however, is capable of unimaginable evil. That doesn't mean that every person is as bad as they could be. But you can go to hell being a a moral person that everybody in in your neighborhood thinks the world of you. If you don't repent of your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you've not been born again, the Bible says you will not go to heaven. You stand as an enemy to God. The reason that you do what you do is because you're following the desires of your heart. You see in verse 24 that God's wrath is demonstrated by just giving someone over to the desires of their heart. People live their life going along, think they're, they're doing what they want to do and everything is going well, and all they're doing is storing up wrath for themselves. Now for the believer, you might be sitting here and wondering and saying, well, what about me? What about me? Does this mean that when a person's heart is, is changed, when they become a Christian, that they don't sin? I mean, is that the marker? No, that's not what the, the Bible says. He changes your heart, changes your desires. You have different desires. It means that you've been set free from the power of sin. That in Christ, that you can grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you can you can be more and more like Jesus Christ. How do you do that? Very important, we understand this. Oftentimes, this is the place where people uh, slide into legalism, and they think that the way that they're right with God is by doing good things, doing uh, these, these religious type things that make them look like they're a good person. That, that doesn't count at all. That's not what this is all about. It's about an intimate relationship with Christ. Uh, the Puritan preachers used to talk about the expulsive power of the greater affection and the way that we're transformed. The Holy Spirit works in our heart as we grow in our love for Jesus Christ. It expels, it pushes out the competing affections in our heart. And, and in this, we're conformed to the image of Christ as we love God more and more. God conforms us. It's not about me checking off boxes and do this and don't do that. It's about growing in an intimate, truthful relationship with Jesus Christ. And in this, God is going to change you. That's the reason Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the, full, the desires of the flesh. When you're walking by, with Jesus, the closer that you walk with Jesus, as you're the ordinary practices of the faith, as you're studying God's Word, obeying God's Word, you're in prayer, you're in fellowship with other believers, you're living your life as a committed follower of Jesus Christ. That's walking by the Spirit. As you do that, you'll find more and more Holy Spirit just working in your heart, changing you little by little by little. Now, this is important because there's a world of difference between behavior modification, and there's a whole lot of folks, that's exactly what they teach. It's just basically behavior modification. Do this and don't do this, and everything will be okay. No, Jesus says, love him. Abide in him. Walk with him. Be honest with him. He's going to change your heart day by day, moment by moment. And the good work that he began in you, Christian, listen, He's going to bring it to fulfillment. You can be certain of that. However, although Christians are being changed to be more like Jesus, we also oftentimes, like the rest of the world, choose to exchange the truth of God for a lie. When you sin, the Bible says, repent. That's what John says in 1 John 1, 9. That's how Christians are to... Listen, I hope that you're, you're, you're understanding, if you're an unbeliever, that the only, the only way you're going to be right with God is to repent and put your faith in Jesus. And if you're, if you're a believer, God calls you to follow Him, to, to live a holy life. That means living according to this book. That's what it's all about. Living, following Jesus Christ, rather than following our heart. Because here's the main point that I'm trying to get across to you today. Following your heart leads to trouble. 
However, following God results in a life of peace and joy, even in the midst of difficulty and and trying circumstances. God extends his hand of grace if you're willing to accept it. And that's illustrated in the very last phrase of verse 25, where the Apostle Paul says, who is speaking about God, who is blessed forever, amen. You see, Paul understands that to know God intimately is the reason that we're made, that his life and your life has a purpose. And therefore, in the middle of his teaching about other people who won't worship God, Paul breaks out into praise and worship of God himself. Why? Because he loves the Lord. He's just walking with the Lord. Let me ask you this. How about your life? Are you convinced that the meaning and purpose of your life is to know and to walk with God? Or do you believe that your life is about satisfying every desire of your heart? Unless your heart is daily knitted together with Jesus Christ, your heart is going to lead you astray every single time. It's like a gauge on a dashboard. If you're wandering off into sin, Christian, it's telling you about your relationship with God. If you've sinned, you can get that right. Just repent. Tell on yourself. And he promises to forgive you because of Jesus. That's the glorious truth of the gospel. I trust that the teaching of God's word was a ministry to you today. Uh, Again, I want to invite you to come out to our services at 645 on Wednesday evenings and on Sunday morning for our worship at 1030. In addition to that, we have a variety of opportunities and activities throughout the week to minister to both children and adults. You can find out more information on our website. God bless. I hope you have a great day.